What up, gang? This Ken Zerk, Ken Zilligan, Zika Milligan, and Villain Filler Trilligan, and we are back on Umi Naku no Naku Koro Ni. Last episode, shit. Um, a lot of shit happened actually. Well, did a lot of shit happen? No, crazy shit happened though. Beatrice is back. We haven't seen the bitch, but she's back. She announced her retirement and she announced that she's taking all of her shit back. And she announced how we can prevent that from happening. So, let's see what's, uh, let's see what Beatrice has going on. The strange lady that the witch had entrusted to Mario wiped all the memories of our dinner from our minds. Mario was repeatedly barraged with questions by Aunt Rosa and the other parents, and became increasingly ill-tempered when they refused to believe her. If we kids tried to butt in, they'd probably ignore us. Our parents were all stirred up, firing back and forth about the gold and the distribution of the assets, and completely forgetting that we were even there. I had already guessed they'd been talking like this in the shadows, but I hadn't thought they'd be so blunt. It gave all of us kids a considerable shock. From what we could overhear, all the parents wanted more money as soon as possible. Back and forth about grandfather's inheritance. Back and forth about the distribution of the gold if it was found. About advance payments and cash. It was so despicable I could, barely, I could hardly bear to watch, even though one of them was my father. It looked like Jessica felt the same way. We left our seats without being asked to and went to hang out somewhere well away from our parents. I get it. Now I totally see why grandfather hates coming down for meals. I'm so disillusioned with our parents right now. All that about money and in the inheritance. How can they act like that right out in the open? Well, I'm already completely disillusioned with my old bastard. There's no way I could think any worse of him. That's exactly the same for me. Still, that freaking shocked me. Shocked me to the core. Jessica looked down at the floor, irritated. She was always talking about how bad her parents were. But maybe she hadn't really felt that way deep inside. The depths of Jessica's shock made that clear. Your own mind is being supported by your parents, so you might not understand. But getting money is neither a simple nor a pretty thing. I won't try to force you to understand right now since you're still kids. But even so, I want you to realize that your parents are just doing their best in their own way. Oh, great. George gotten all mature. George, I know you're working hard as a full-fledged member of society. But does that mean you turn into a shameless, greedy vulture like our parents whenever you start talking about money and assets? Does he? Come on, George. Don't do that. If it were only for my own benefit, then no, I wouldn't want to do that. However, when your family and your employees, your subordinates and their families are all counting on you, there are some times when you must fight. I hate that kind of fight. That back and forth about grandfather's inheritance just makes me want to puke. Jessica pretended to spit violently. That harsh reaction made the depths of her pain very clear. Let's stop talking about this. All this about grandfather's hidden gold, property, and inheritance is our parents' problem, not ours. I agree. At the very least, I think children have a duty to be considerate and stay out of their parents' way when they're talking together. Sounds pretty boring. Everyone knows the adult, the, the phrase adults are filthy, but we had now seen that for ourselves and that really did give us a considerable shock. George was now pretty much an adult and I'd already been disillusioned with my dad so the shock wasn't that big for us, but Jessica seemed to be taking it hard. Apparently she'd received a bigger blow than I thought. She always talks badly about her parents, but it looks like she hadn't changed at all in the inside. Even now, she's still a pure-hearted, delicate person who can't doubt others. I'm sure she respected her parents as much as anyone else does. And then her parents started raging about going, 
money, money, inheritance, inheritance, my money. Right in front of all the other parents and children. No surprise you perceived that such a shock from hearing that. Jessica, Jessica please don't start hating your mother and father. I won't ask you to understand them, but at least don't hate them. I get it, just leave me alone for a bit. Six years ago, I would have kept taunting Jessica even after she gotten all dejected. But I guess I really have grown over the last six years. I realize it'd be better to leave Jessica alone right now. Jessica suddenly looked away sulkily and left the parlor. She probably wanted to be alone for a while. I could do nothing but wordlessly watch her back as she left. Come to think of it, I wonder where Mario went. She's probably pouting in front of the portrait. Maria truly looked up to witches, and she'd expected that coming in direct contact with Beatrice and receiving the letter as proof would surprise everyone and make them happy. However, the adults had doubted its authenticity, thoroughly bombarding with Maria with questions and refusing to accept her story. Even for me, it wasn't hard to imagine how, how much that must have hurt Maria. We couldn't speak to Maria or Jessica. In the end, George and I just abandoned ourselves in the sound of the falling rain in the dark of night. I wonder what's happening with that typhoon. Maybe there's something about it on the news. George started walking over to the corner of the parlor where the television was. He hadn't called me over and I really couldn't have cared less what the typhoon was on the scene now. So without going over to the television, I loitered around the window. The wind hasn't picked up, picked up that much here, but I wonder if it's horrible over the seas. I did hear about a severe storm warning on the weather report. Ah, Kirie. I take it those big talks between the adults are going smoothly, yeah? She seemed to catch the sarcasm. Kirie shrugged. I wonder if that stomach ache of a discussion will continue all night. It's not going to be fun. Well then, please enjoy playing vultures to grandfather's property as much as you like. I feel sick. I'll agree with you on that. If I could just slip away like you, I'd do it. Unfortunately, I can't. Even if I'm not allowed to speak, we spouses have it pretty rough too. Kirie took a deep breath, smiling bitterly. That's right. They probably wouldn't let Kirie speak since she's only married into the family. Still, as dad's partner, she had no choice but to stay by his side and support him. She's probably had to bear the full brunt of this mental pressure much more than me. I wasn't going to apologize, but realizing that I'd spoken too harshly, I cut the sarcasm for the time being. So, how does it look? Are they still stuck on the topic of the mysterious witch Beatrice? More or less. Those four siblings are, only, are always piling up secret agreements when they come together to discuss the division of grandfather's inheritance. They're saying that some unknown fifth person has appeared and is trying to make things even more complicated. There's no way that'll make for a peaceful conversation. Just when you think they're snarling at each other, they'll set up a common front. Not so he's not the only one getting headaches. On the, on the one hand, they all want a larger portion than the other siblings, so they're all rivals. But on the other hand, they don't want one yen to be snatched up by anyone other than the siblings, so they're also all allies. I hadn't been told the, told the details, but the siblings were apparently discussing how to protect their shares under various situations. Setting up ceasefire agreements and rules to prevent anyone from getting an unfair advantage. Even preparing to resort to legal action if absolutely necessary. That they would go this far to preserve their shares was so beyond disgusting that you had to just acknowledge their resilience. So basically, Beatrice was like being an assassin sent by grandfather. He probably wanted to scare the hell out of his children for talking about inheritance without him. Who is this Beatrice, I wonder? If everything she claims is true, then she's a mystery figure that no one knew about until today. And she also knows about Grandfather's hidden gold. On top of that, she was also entrusted with the head's ring. She must truly have been trusted by him. 
Well, obviously, I don't think she's a witch riding around on a broom. But there's no doubt she's a mysterious person who's earned the right to be called a witch. If only Maria would go into more detail about that. Everyone's been smothering her even though she's just a little girl. They really scared her and some things they might have asked now can't... And some things they might have asked now can't be asked. I wonder if those people have ever even read The North Wind and the Sun. What we do know is that Maria received a letter from a person who took the name Beatrice. She sure is shy for a mystery person and trusting Maria with a letter and hiding away even now when she could have just appeared and talked to us directly. Hey, battler. Do you really think a person called Beatrice actually exists? Who knows? Doesn't it really seem like a false name? Like she's grandfather's representative, so she was given permission to take the name of the witch from his delusions? No, that's not what I meant. Right now, there's a total of 18 people here in Rock and Jima. Do you think there's a 19th person? They think this is. I'm sorry. Oh, man, I might have just spoiled for somebody who hasn't played it yet. Or watch my series. I I'm gonna have to edit that. I'm, I'm gonna have to like edit over that spoiler. Are there really a full 18 people on this island right now? Wondering about that, I began counting on my fingers. And it really did come out to that many. Do I think that a 19th person exists? What exactly do you mean? Just what I said. The person who lent Maria that umbrella supposedly went one of, wasn't one of us 18. So isn't it natural to assume that a 19th person exists? And that this person lent Maria the umbrella? Well, yeah, it sure looks that way. Then where exactly is this person now? At the very least, she must have been on this island when it started raining. And ever since that time, the weather has gone progressively worse. Progressively worse. So taking a boat out would pre be pretty much impossible. In that case, that person must still be on the island, hiding from the rain somewhere, and without any of us spotting her. True. We've all been randomly prowling around all over the mansion in the guest house, but no one has bumped into a 19th person. But this island is huge. There might be other places that take shelter from the rain other than the mansion in the guest house. At about this time, I began to realize what direction Kyrie's suspicions were taking us in. Kyrie was denying that a 19th person existed. Beatrice was one of us 18. In other words, she thought someone we knew well was tricking us. If Beatrice is who she claims, she would surely be the most honored of guests, the most honored of confidence trusted by Grandfather. There's no way Grandfather wouldn't give that kind of person a warm reception. She would surely have been ushered into the mansion. However, we haven't seen anyone like that. Wait a sec. Isn't his line of reasoning a bit too hasty? Sure, no one spotted this person, but doesn't that mean but that doesn't mean you can't deny the possibility of a 19th person, right? Maybe for some reason they landed on the island stealthily and been hiding ever since. It's what they call a devil's proof. It's easy to prove that something exists. If this Beatrice appeared in front of all of us and says hi, then it's settled. But it's impossible to prove that there's no 19th person. Yes. Battler, your way of reasoning isn't bad. In our current situation, there isn't enough information to either accept or deny that a 19th person exists. But if you spin the chessboard around and think that way, we can deny the, we can deny the existence of a 19th person with near certainty. Spin the chessboard around was one of Kyrie's favorite phrases. I've been influenced by those words and used them myself from time to time. When you get stuck trying to find a move in chess or shogi, then by spinning the board around and looking at everything from your opponent's standpoint, you can often see a strategy that will give you the upper hand. That means turning things around and putting yourself in your opponent's shoes. You see, let's say that a 19th person called Beatrice actually exists. 
That person must have managed, without being seen by anyone, to stealthily arrive on this island and remain hidden ever since. Maybe they had some reason, okay? In that case, why did they go to all the trouble of appearing before Maria and handing her the letter? It really was a contradiction. They had some reason of hiding themselves, and they should have stayed hidden the whole time. But even so, they had appeared openly in front of Maria. See, now they're thinking too deeply into this. When the truth and the easiest answer and the tr most truthful answer is that the bitch is a witch. You feel me? Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Then, wait, Maria said it herself. She said the witch made her a messenger. Maybe that's because Maria was the youngest and looked the most obedient. Why would they need a messenger? If they just wanted a letter delivered to the family conference, they could have mailed it. If they mailed it to each of the four siblings, no one would be able to ignore it. There was no need for this person to carry it themselves and secretly deliver it by hand. Maybe they wanted to cause an uproar. Like, they really wanted, like, an uproar. Like, maybe they're just fucking eccentric. You know? They were just feeling goofy and silly. Yeah. That does sound pretty weird. In the first place, if Beatrice existed and wanted to make her presence known to everyone, then she could have just openly presented herself to all of us. Despite that, she chose a vague method of appearing through a little girl called Maria and only gave us a vague impression of who she was. Contradiction. Let's go a little deeper, shall we? She appeared in front of Maria trying to give us the impression that a 19th person existed and yet She still hasn't appeared before us and is hiding somewhere at this very moment Think about those contradictions You've got to keep these things in mind when you spin the chessboard around In short, if a person wants to leave us with the impression that Beatrice exists as the 19th person What might their goal be? This person wanted to hide, and they wouldn't have made their presence known. And if they wanted to show themselves, they wouldn't have used a roundabout approach of entrusting someone with a letter. Which means... It's simple. Beatrice is one of the 18th people. That's why they want to create an illusion that there are more than 18 people. The 19th person was revealed so spectacularly. If someone were to profit from this, it wouldn't be some 19th person in hiding. It'd be one of the original 18 people. Of course, his reasoning is full of holes. If you turn over even a few of its premises, it'll simply fall apart. But I'm almost completely certain it's correct. She's so fucking wrong, it's hilarious. I don't know much about Umi Neko, but I know the witch is real. <laughs> this is starting to feel pretty damn creepy. Someone lent Maria the umbrella and handed her the letter. Supposedly, none of the 18 did this. And yet, Beatrice was hidden among those 18. What was this person planning, hiding their true form and pretending to be Beatrice? I suspected it might have been Maria's play acting, but the contents of the message were extremely complicated, and it's hard to imagine Maria writing that herself. However, I can't deny a possibility that Maria is working together with someone. Wait a sec. Maria's a nine-year-old kid, right? What could she possibly be planning and with whom? And what about a straightforward, overly honest, obedient nature? Yeah, I also understand what kind of person Maria is. But that's exactly why I think it's possible. That girl's a dreamer who can't help but look up to and blindly accept the existence of witches. So if a person were to appear in front of her and claim to be the witch Beatrice, Maria would happily swallow it up, I think. So you're saying that if someone disguised themselves by wearing that fancy dress from the portrait, tricking Maria wouldn't be that hard? Of course. With that reasoning, all of us women would be the primary suspects. 
Anyway, who did Maria encounter? Learning the details of that question would be best key to solving this riddle. But this key has been firmly locked away inside Maria's heart. Everyone denied the existence of the witch without listening to it, barraging her too much with questions about who Beatrice actually was. She probably won't open her heart to the adults now. In the dim hall in front of the portrait of Beatrice, Mario was sobbing. No one believes I met Beatrice! Even though I showed them the letter Beatrice gave me, they still don't believe! Fuck all them niggers, they bitches anyway. <laughs> the witches go fuck them in they booty holes. <laughs> anyway, Maria's holding the key. The key to whether Beatrice is one of the 18th people or the 19th person. Maria's stubborn, right? When that girl gets angry, it's pretty hard to make her feel better. My eyes hurt like a bitch. Battling. I think a kid like you would be better at cheering her up than an adult like me. After she's feeling better, try asking. I know you don't care about all this back and forth about the inheritance, but don't you find this Western mention mystery situation exciting? Who in the world is this person who gave Maria the letter? It makes your intellectual curiosity ache. You're actually pretty tough, considering you're still excited after being dragged through that endless money talk. Adults can be pretty amazing. I shrugged exasperatedly, but I did notice something. Kyrie noticed how dejected I was after overhearing our parents' turbulent discussion and was probably trying to clear the air. At the very least, I recovered enough to voice my complaints. She wasn't my real mother, so I never felt like calling her mom. But it did make me think, she's a real adult. Hey Brett, so this is where you were. Kiria, you really took your time fixing your makeup, didn't you? Think I'll make a habit of going out to touch up my makeup too. I'm sorry. A woman's makeup takes a long time. So? How has the discussion been without me? <laughs> I'm sure everything was peaceful and harmonious. Kyrie poked a weak spot under my arm with her elbow. We decided to take a break to cool our heads a little. It looks like we'll be at it all night. It makes me want to cry. His way of talking hadn't changed, but he couldn't completely hide his fatigue. I, could, I couldn't say I was sympathetic, but he looked pitiful compared to his normal energetic self. Still, that range is awful. I really don't want to go back to the guest house. Looks like Natsuhi set things up so we could spend the night here in the mansion. What do we do? We don't need to decide until we're done, right? If you run so low on energy that you can't return to our room, then we could take them up on their offer. You're right. We could think about it later. What about you, battler? If I stay, I just get in the way. I'll be nice and go back over there. I see. Will you go back soon? I don't know. It'd be lonely to head back by myself. I'll gather all the kids and we'll head out. Okay. You go do that. Also, battling. You won't be going to sleep that easily tonight, right? Yeah, I'll probably be out talking with the cousins. Sounds like we'll be up all night. Is there a problem with that? I see. If you're still awake when the adult discussion is over, I want to have a little talk as a family. A what? That doesn't sound like you. Apparently, Kiria was thinking the same thing. What are you talking about? She asked him with a small voice. But like Kiria didn't have a clue what dad meant either. I also want to talk to you about it, Kyrie. I'll tell you later, so don't ask now. Please. I don't know anyone who neglects the concept of family as much as this old bastard. 
And now he's saying we're gonna have a talk as a family. Both Kiria and I couldn't help but get wide-eyed. Don't look so terrified. I'm the one who should be terrified. After all. At that point, he swallowed up his words for an instant. Even though putting on airs and of putting on airs of importance wasn't much like my dad. You're freaking me out, Dad. Everyone in our family is gathered here now, right? Don't make a big deal out of it and spit it out. Tonight, I will probably be killed. What the? Huh? My nigga, just like that? Wait, what the fuck? Hold on, don't take my nigga Rudolph. Besides Kenzo, that's my favorite character. There was a huge crash of thunder. Must have been really close. Dad's expression being illuminated by the lightning was burning in my eyes. Dad's face. It's always looked so sure of itself and which always wore a taunting expression was strangely frail in a way I couldn't really explain. It was so worn out that he looked like a different person. What the fuck? Huh? What? What are you What are you talking about? That doesn't sound like you. I agree. What happened? You look so timid all of a sudden. It's not like you. I'm... I'm gonna go fix my makeup too. Don't follow me. Dad turned away weakly. After that, only Kyrie and I were left still wide-eyed. What did he say? Tonight he'll be killed. You don't think that mysterious letter scared him, do you? He's been watching too many serial murder movies. Does he know? Does he, should I tell him? I mean, what am I going to tell him? I don't fucking know either. He might die, he might not. I'm going to find out. Kiria didn't answer my lighthearted words and continued staring at my dad's disappearing back. Battling. When you told Rudolph to spill the beans right away, he left without telling us anything. Even though he said he had something to say to both of us, he didn't answer you. Why? Spin the chessboard around. What do you see? Well, when he said he wanted to talk but then couldn't, that's a contradiction. What? Can you see something by looking at it from Dad's perspective? Yes, I can see something. He wants to talk about something. However, he doesn't have the courage to bring it up. So he actually means chase after me, talk to me, and ask me about it yourself. By saying don't follow me, he actually means the opposite. He actually means follow me and force me to answer. Seriously, what a soon what a spoiled brat. What? Can you really call that reasoning? That's ridiculous. Can great private and police detectives deduce the emotions and feelings between men and women? They can't, right? Figuring out the feelings of the opposite sex is an even more advanced art than exposing the tricks in a difficult crime case. If you ask me, romance novels have much deeper mysteries than masterpiece mystery novels. I see. Is that how it is? I was saying alongside that spoiled brat. He normally loves to bluff, but tonight, he'll be completely tired from that heated discussion. He probably wants someone to lean on at that moment. And responding to that need is the role of, this, of his partner. Sounds passionate. Then I'll leave that old bastard in your hands. Yes, leave it to me. I called out to Kyrie, departing back. What? Um, I wanted to say thanks. Thanks to you, my gloomy mood has cleared up a lot. That's good. Communication is important. I fucking love you, Kyrie. After answering with a wink, Kyrie followed after dad.
Not so he could be found in a dimly lit hallway. Now and then the thunder would crash, but this had no effect on Natsuhi's expression. She looked completely worn out. The discussion that had just taken place between the relatives in the dining hall was repeating itself inside Natsuhi's mind. Beatrice had to proclaim that in addition to the gold, all of the inheritance and property of the Oshiramiya family would be given to the person who could solve the riddle. In other words, she planned to undermine the absolute guarantee that Krauss, as the oldest brother, had to succeed the family head. Originally, the other siblings had absolutely no chance to inherit the headship. To them, this proposal by Beatrice was extremely desirable. It was obvious that they would accept it. There was no need to play some clumsy detective game. Not until he knew that this so-called 19th person, Beatrice, couldn't exist. Naturally, Beatrice was nothing more than a fictional character used to pass a message that Kenzo had written himself. As proof, Kenzo remained stubbornly neutral as to that letter's authenticity. He was completely ignoring these reckless claims that, the sh that he shouldn't be able to ignore that he had given up the head's ring. In short, Kenzo had wordlessly admitted that the letter held its own, held its own message. Most likely, one of the servants had given Maria the letter. Kenzo had probably worked out an elaborate plan where the dress from the porch would be prepared. And someone, probably Shannon, would be made to wear it and deliver the letter and the umbrella. By doing that, he could make it seem like the wish from the portrait actually existed. No. If anything, that alone was proof that Kenzo was behind all this. In that case, it was the same as Kenzo trying to butt in on the siblings' private discussion. Then Kenzo, by announcing he'd give everything to the person who solved the riddle, could weaken Krause's overwhelming advantage. Now it was certain. Kenzo had eavesdropped on his siblings' discussion in the parlor earlier that day, so he had known how Krause had staved off the attack by the other three. And to, and to make the scale of the, scales of the battle go back into balance, he had sent out this strange letter which benefited Krause's rivals. He was trying to push this crazy theory so that Rosa, who had a weak position among the siblings because of her age, would join with Ava and Rudolph. Then with the three to one advantage, they'd be able to overwhelm Krauss yet again and make their ridiculous theories get accepted by force. And by doing that, he gave them the power to resettle what had once been a nearly decided conflict. They had now st started repeatedly pressing Krauss to pay them a large amount of money using the condition that all the siblings would guarantee Krause's position as a successor, talk about advance payments, was being brought up again despite having been rejected once. Of course, even without the story about the hidden gold, the Oshiramiya family's store of wealth was vast. That store of wealth alone was more than enough. Even if the hidden gold was buried forever along with Kenzo's death, there would be more than enough to satisfy. Therefore, even if they weren't that interested in the gold itself, Kenzo had managed to instill the lifelong fear that, on the off chance that someone found that gold, that person would be granted his headship. And this kind of Achilles heel would definitely be taken advantage of by someone sooner or later. The only person with this fatal weakness was the successor, Kraus. The other siblings had found, no, he had been told by Kenzo about something that only Kraus could lose and they have thoroughly taken advantage of that. Natsuhi has Krause's only ally in his painful position and as his wife, wanted to fight alongside him. She kept trying to explain to him that the existence of the gold itself was a farce and that there was no need for him to, be comp for him to compromise. Krause had always told Natsuhi, he had told all of the siblings, he always, always said that the hidden gold was nothing more than an illusion created by Kenzo. Therefore, Natsuhi had believed it as his wife and had supported her husband on that foundation. Even so, Natsuhi's words didn't reach Kraus. Even after Natsuhi had fought so hard and had lent all of her strength, he continued to fight by himself and was trying to compromise with the other three siblings. Natsuhi sadly and weakly wondered why she could not be of use to him. Then she started getting angry. Kraus is such a bitch, bro. I genuinely fucking hate this nigga, dawg. Like, dead ass. I genuinely hate this nigga. 
You got such a loyal and supportive wife and you just ignoring her. Come on, bro. Like, if I had Natsuhi, dead ass, real shit, bro. If I had Natsuhi, she would never have a headache again. I would treat that bitch like a fucking queen, bro. This nigga Kraus don't know what to do with her. He don't know what to do with her. He got a day one. He got a ride or die. He got the most loyal bitch in the game. The most loyal bitch. Not even a bitch. He's got the most loyal lady in the game. And he's treating her like another hoe. Nigga, fuck Kraus, bro. I fucking hate this bitch ass nigga. It had happened when everyone decided to take a short break to cool their heads. Not until he had flared up against Kraus. In rage, he asked why she couldn't, why she could not be useful to him. He had told her that he wanted to talk about something and invited her into a room that she was normally not allowed to enter. That room had been sealed with a heavy looking padlock and just looking at it gave her an uncomfortable feeling. There's no need for you to worry about anything said by those three, or even the suspicious person who calls herself Beatrice. After all, the gold is just a ruse created by father. There's no way something like that could be found. Your position as a successor is a solid fact. What are you afraid of? Krauss removed the padlock on the door. He then motioned for Natsuhi to enter. Enter. What, what is this? There's something I want to I want you to see. I've never shown you this before. Natsuhi timidly opened the door with a dubious expression on her face. It was pitch black. She searched for a switch to turn on the lights, but since this was her first time in the room, she didn't know where it was. Kraus entered behind her, pushing her in. And when he closed the door before turning on the lights, the two were swallowed up by the darkness. Only the sound of Kraus locking the door rang out through the dark. What are you doing? The lights. I am turning them on now. Wait. Just as he said, when Kraus pushed the switch on the wall, a flickering light turned on and lit up the room. That is... Not until he had her breath taken away. The room had no windows, and at a glance it appeared to be empty. In the middle of the room, a small round table had been set, and the lights brightened only that table, as if it were the leading part in the play. On top of the table, a red a tablecloth of elaborate design had been set out covered with dust. And on top of that, something about the size of a grown man's arm had been set down. That something took Natsui's breath away. Oh shit, a gold bar. It's a gold ingot of incredible purity. Without this, no one would have believed in the legend of the gold. It was an ingot of solid gold. Even in the faint light, it sparkled with a noble and dignified glint. This is not a proper ingot. I don't even know whether it was cast aside or outside the country. It took a high level of skill to make the purest of solid gold ingots. And in order to verify that purity, it was stranded to have the original foundry in the name of the bank that guaranteed it and printed on the gold. However, this ingot did not have that kind of seal. This mysterious gold bar had come from an unknown foundry. Look here. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a bar of gold. Natsui, following Krauss's words, timidly approached the ingot. Right there. Krauss pointed at the surface of the ingot. Natsui concentrated on that section. Right there was the imprint of the one-winged eagle crest. Natsui's breath was taken away once again. That's right. This is the legendary ingot that father said he received from the witch. That is the president of Ma Marusu witnessed and was, and was allowed to select at random to take back with him. That gained the trust of the fixers in the business world. I had to use all means possible to find it. I found it before the, all the other siblings could. How could... 
then the legend of father's gold is it actually exists the gold that Oshiro Miya Kenzo received from Beatrice actually exists impossible so it really does exist Natsu was shocked Krauss had always said that Kenzo's gold was just a fabrication so she believed it as his wife However, the reality was different. This bitch-ass nigga was lying to his wife the whole time. Since he held definite proof, he had been more certain than any of the other siblings that the legend of the gold was true. Because of this, Cross was deeply frightened at the possibility that someone other than himself would find the gold he'd failed to find, costing him everything. <coughs> but to Natsuhi, this truth was more than enough to split open her heart. She had thought that as Krauss's wife, she should be his closest confidant, which is why she had selflessly supported him. And yet, he had hid this fact from her until today. Why? Have I been so undeserving of your trust? That has never been my intention. There was simply no need to tell you. Is that all a, a wife? means to you calm down becoming passionate easily in one of your bad habits you're the one who's making me like that aren't you i've been supporting you as a wife ever since i married into this family for your sake i threw away the family i was born into and i've been offering up my heart and my body to serve you and in return this is what i get how could how could you Kraus grimaced, annoyed. His expression effectively communicated how much he disliked this part of Natsui, even if he didn't say it out loud. But he's such a bitch! Like, he can't even fucking sympathize with his wife and how she feels about this situation, even though you spent all these years fucking lying to her and tricking her and manipulating her. You can't even sympathize with her feeling betrayed and hurt. Instead, you look annoyed. Like, bro, I fuck, I, I genuinely hate this nigga. Like, it's, it's fucking 11 p.m. right now. After I finish recording this, I'm about to go to bed in a bad fucking mood. Because I'm about to be thinking about how much I fucking hate this bitch ass nigga, bro. Like, I'm actually about to start a fucking fuck Krauss campaign. Because this nigga is such a bitch. It doesn't look like... I will be of any use to you anymore. That's fine. Fuck you, bro! I can resolve the troubles with the siblings by myself. I don't need your help. I'm just saying, man. If I had Natsuhi, she would never make that fucking expression a day in her life. All them headaches she be getting, she wouldn't get none of them damn headaches. She wouldn't get none of them shits. Like, for real, if I had Natsuhi, Natsuhi, baby, just come over here. Like, for real. You can do better than him. Come over here. You can do better than that, bitch-ass nigga. He ugly as fuck anyways. Like, what do you like about this ugly-ass narcissist? No Cardi. Like, what do you even like about this nigga? There's nothing to like about this bitch. Come over here. Come see what a real nigga look like, bro. Come see how a real nigga treat a lady. <laughs> All right, bro. That's wrong! This is the Yoshiro Mia family's problem! It's true that I am not permitted to wear the family crest on my body, but I am still your wife. Even so, are you saying I'm not capable of helping you? Are you? I especially wouldn't want to risk you getting involved. It would probably make your headaches even worse than they are now. Take a rest for today. The siblings will deal with the siblings' problem. It has nothing to do with you. That is all. At least he tried to sound concerned for her towards the end. But I'm not convinced that he's actually concerned. I think he was just saying that to shut her the fuck up. A dull headache tormented Natsuhi. No matter what medicine she took, no matter what scent she burned, it wouldn't heal. In fact, simply wandering alone through the dark corridors and listening to the sound of the rain seemed to be a better cure. 
I just feel so fucking horrible for Nasuhi, man. She does not deserve this shit. I may be Natsuhi, but I was never with Shiramiya Natsuhi. I've been despised and treated as a borrowed wound and insulted when I couldn't even feel that role. Even so, I've tried to properly perform my duties as a wife. But even now, even my husband has rejected me. I've done my best raising my daughter as if it were the last job left for me. However, I've no relief from my le release. However, I've not, I've had no release from my anger and sadness, and they've const and they've caused me to subconsciously strain that relationship too. Cause I've been excessively strict in Jessica's education. She dislikes me thoroughly. She despises me for having no interest in anything but grades. There is no longer anything I can do for the Oshira Mia family. No, that's no good. Despite it all, I must help my husband and beat back the schemes of the other greedy siblings. The family head won't be around much longer. Eventually, Cross will succeed the head, and the next successor will be Jessica. Strictly speaking, the man who enters the family by marrying Jessica will become the next head. But it all comes to the same. It all comes to the same thing. I have to make Jessica an excellent success whom everyone will accept as worthy to take over the Oshira Mia family. In the days to come, the greedy Oshira Mia Ava will probably be plotting to find some fault with the main family. And if all goes as she plans, Jessica will be dragged down from the succession with George set up in her place. It is regrettable, but George is a man and even more has matured as a person. Compared to Jessica, who's right in the middle of her rebellious period and whose grades are slightly below average, it can be seen at a glance who is more fit to succeed the head. So in order to secure Jessica's position, I need to turn her into an excellent person. After doing that, I want to find her an excellent husband worthy of the excellent person she will have to become. A wonderful man who will truly accept Jessica and stay with her through all the life's joys and sorrows. Was Natsuhi trying to entrust her daughter with fulfilling some desire of her own? Natsuhi thought back on the day she'd had no choice but to marry into the Ashura Mia family because of that unavoidable fate. She had tried to block that from her memory. She had subconsciously forgotten it and had even attended to the life she had been given as Ashura Mia Natsuhi. And in doing so, she had built up a new life. But just now, it felt like all of that was being was been has been casually rejected. How should I think as how how should I think as I live my life? I do not know. Not till we helplessly re re rested her head against the glass of the window. The glass, which was cool thanks to the raindrops beating against it, felt somehow refreshing. Fuck! I'm so I'm so I'm so fucking sorry. I'm so damn sorry. Natsui helplessly rested her head against the glass of the window. The glass which was cool thanks to the raindrops beating against it felt somehow refreshing. Even though it should have been emotionless, right then, it seemed to be the only thing that could understand Natsui. At that point, even if someone had appeared, Natsui didn't intend to pay any attention to them. But she did pay attention. Because it was her beloved daughter. Oh, it's you, Mom. What the heck are you doing out in a place like this? Thought you were a ghost. Just like always, her words was rough and not at all like a girl's. Instinctively, words of rebuke rose to Natsui's throat. However, their strength gave out and they didn't escape her lips. Jessica, forgive me, but my headache is awful. Please, leave me be. I see. Jessica was seeing her mother in a position of feebleness for the first time, so she was considerably disconcerting. Until just now, she'd been filled with contempt for all her parents, including her mother. For all of the parents. But now, those feelings have been completely swept away. Her mother's utterly exhausted face had wiped them all out. 
In its place, the words George had told her floated back up into her mind. Our parents are doing their best in their own way. And because their families are counting on them, they can't afford to keep everything pleasant and have a heavy responsibility to fight. Maybe your mother had been standing around in this dimly lit hallway because no one had tried to understand that in her. Jessica hated her mother, so she had no intention of speaking kindly to Natsui just because she was looking a bit frail. So when she attempted to speak kindly to her mother anyway, she had to clench her fists and gather up the words from deep in her heart. It sounds like you've really got your hands full with that meeting thing. It has nothing to do with you. Please, go somewhere else. Is your headache bad? Should I go get you some medicine? You don't need to trouble yourself. Please, leave me alone. Natsui wasn't being cold. She just wanted her daughter to go far away so that she wouldn't have to bump against Natsui's own short temper. But there was no chance that Jessica would realize this. Okay. Jessica hung her head looking sad. Seeing that expression, Natsui recognized the kindness that Jessica was trying to muster. She gave her head a small shake to drive away her own unkind feelings. Then I'll leave. I'll be with the other cousins so I don't get in the way of the adults. See you later. Wait, wait there. She called Jessica who was trying to leave and looked lonely to a stop. What? Thank you for being so considerate. It isn't good for me it isn't good of me to go to sleep and leave you alone. Don't talk like that, you'll bring bad luck. I've made you worry, but I'm okay now. I will go. If I let my daughter see me this feeble any longer, it'll only make her more it'll only make, it'll only make her feel more uneasy. With that thought in mind, Natsui left Jessica with words of gratitude and made to depart. This time, Jessica called out to her mother's back. Natsui stopped and turned around, asking what business Jessica had with her. But Jessica herself didn't know why she'd stopped her mother. And for a while, she smiled wryly, muttering to herself as she hesitated over what to say. She was poking around in her pocket when her hand touched something and she took it out. Um, hey mom, I uh, was given a charm today. What was it, uh, a charm against magic? Um, I'm pretty sure that you were supposed to hang it from your doorknob, I think. Ha, uh, I forget. There's no point in me having it, so I'll let you take it. It was a scorpion charm that Maria had given her on the beach. Although she'd heard of its various effects from Maria, Jessica's mind had gone blank, and so she was just barely able to say even that much. Jessica, thinking that her mother probably wouldn't accept it anyway, immediately drew back the hand she had stuck out, grasping the charm. So when Natsui came back to take it, she was extremely shocked. What is this? Some kind of prize toy. Well, it's... I think it's something like that. I guess you wouldn't really expect a charm that looks like a toy to do anything. But her mother took the charm from where she grasped it in her hand. Thank you. I'll take good care of it. Sometime soon, in exchange, why don't I give you a charm that was important to me when I was a child? It's not like that's why I give it to you. But, well, if you really say so, then I'll rest for now. My headache is awful. Try not to stay up too late. Sure. Natsui put the charm in her pocket and turned away. She then disappeared into the dark hall. Ah oh, man, that really fucking touched me. Shit like like shit like that always like kind of fucks with me a little bit. It seems the weather will be like this all day tomorrow after all. Dang! This makes the good weather we had earlier feel like a lie. George and I were killing time in front of the parlor television. 
At that point, Jessica returned. <sighs> her face was still blank, but it looked like she'd calmed down a little since we'd last seen her. Is Maria still in front of the portrait? No, she just came back. She's sleeping over there on the sofa. It's getting pretty late for her after all. Looking at the clock, I saw it was a little past 10 p.m. Even if we were planning to stay up all night, it was about time we head back to our room. Well, my mom did have a room prepared for us in the mansion. What do we do? I'd rather head back to the guest house. Going by what we saw of our parents, I think it'd be better if we weren't in that mansion. I agree. Feels like they're telling us kids to mind our own business and stay out of their way. Let's be good little boys and girls and do that. As we were talking about this, Aunt Rosa came into the parlor. She was looking all over restlessly, probably trying to find Maria. Aunt Rosa, if you're looking for Maria, she's over there on the sofa. Thank you. My, she's out cold. We must move her to a bed. If you'd like, I'll carry you over to a bed. Thank you, that would be wonderful. Are you all heading back to the guest house? Or are you going to stay in the room not so we are prepared for you? We were just talking about that. We just decided to head over to the guest house. I see. Then, could I ask you to take Maria with you? I feel much more reassured if she stayed with all your cousins. Behind those words, she seemed to be concealing some regret that the adults, herself included, had deeply hurt Maria's feelings. Leave it to us, Aunt Rosa. After all, we do have an expert at comforting Maria with us. Are you talking about me? I couldn't do it myself. We'll need everyone together. That's right. Battler, weren't you the one who hit it off with Mario when you were messing around earlier? As we sat this, Aunt Rosa smiled, looking truly happy. Thank you, everyone. It looks like our meeting will last until very late. So while I'm sorry to burden you like this, I'll be counting on you all to take care of Maria. Hey, Maria, you sound asleep? We're going back to the guest house. Maria muttered something indistinct, rolled over, and fell back asleep. It looked like she was sleeping deeply. She's really out cold. I hate to wake her. Right, I'll carry her. It is hot as fuck. Well, how will y'all react if I made a video with my shirt off? <laughs> like, if I just took my whole shit off, like, I just went nipples out and everything. Like, I'm a grown-ass nigga. I'm 19 years old, motherfucker. I can legally fuck. So, like... I'm legal fucking age. So, it wouldn't be too crazy for me to have my shirt off. Like, that, like... Would that really be crazy? Mario's body was much lighter than it looked. I lifted her up and put her on George's back. It was raining hard outside, and Aniki couldn't hold an umbrella and carry Mario at the same time. It looked like Aunt Rosa would come with us as far as the guest house to help out. However, when she heard Uncle Krause's voice call out to, call out to her, she had no choice but to return. Now that's a problem. I have to go back now. Is everyone returning to the guest house? After we left the hall, after we left the hall on the way to the entrance, the door to the servant room opened and Shannon stepped out. It has grown very dark, so allow me to guide you. That would be great, Shana. George is going to carry Maria there. Could you hold the umbrella for him? Yes, certainly. Shana brought umbrellas for each of us and a flashlight to guide the way. As we opened the front door, the downpour was quite terrific. Felt like we wouldn't have any spare time to take a pleasant walk and enjoy the nighttime rose garden. Aniki, is she too heavy? Want me to carry her? It's okay. I can at least carry Maria. I'm truly grateful. Please, take care of Maria. Sure, you got it. Then I guess it is good night on Rosa. Then I will see them over there and return here. 
Damn. Yes, please. Aunt Rosa watched us leave. Maria. I'm sorry for everything. Rosa's mumbling voice didn't reach the person in question, nor any of the kids, but disappeared beneath the sign of the rain. They always do that shit. They sit there with no fucking text for who knows how long, and as soon as I go for a drink, they pull up text. After cutting through the rainy rose garden, we arrived at the guest house. Ah, if only I'd applied for the position of Maria's carrier. Then I would have gotten my chance to have Shana's huge ass boobs rubbing all over my arm. That's not why I did it, it's a misunderstanding. I thought that if I didn't walk like this, George would get all wet. Bitch, you all wet, aren't you? Come on, quit babbling and go in. After being urged on by Jessica, we folded up our umbrellas and went inside the guest house. Has anyone gotten their clothes, clothes wet? I can bring some towels if you want. You don't need to worry about us that much. Thanks, Shannon. Ah, uh, that's right. We were planning to play cards or something. Would you care to join us for a bit? Huh? Who had the night shift under their schedule? I believe we had a special schedule during the family conference. Also, I think a few alterations have been made, so I will go and check. Wait, you have to go by yourself. If you have to go all the way back to the mansion to find out, don't force yourself. Oh, that's all right. I can find out from the servant room in the guest house. Please excuse me for a short while. Trying to give a quick bow and went into the guest house servant room. And then Beatrice came out of nowhere and started fucking all the men in the guest house with a 10 inch monster dick strap on. That's what. <laughs> the rest of us had. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so. I'm, I'm, I'm immensely sorry for that. The rest of us headed for the cousin's room and decided to put Mario to bed for the time being. Mario was sleeping very deeply and there was absolutely no sign of her eyes opening. For now, we'd get some soft drinks out of the room's refrigerator and drink those while playing cards or something. I am burning the fuck up. Oh. Kana. And you're here too, Genji? What has happened to tonight's shift? Kraus has given an order. He made some sizable changes to the shift schedule. Indeed. Goda now has the night shift at the mansion. Shannon and Kanon have the night shift in the guest house. Kumasawa and I have been ordered to sleep in the guest house. Right now, a phone call came, saying that once you arrived, you were also to remain here for the rest of the night. Huh? That's certainly a sizable change. The shifts of the guest house and the mansion have been completely reversed, haven't they? Originally, Shannon and Canon had been assigned the night shift at the mansion, while the night shift in the guest house where all the relatives were staying had been assigned to Gota, who had an abundance of experience in entertaining. Kumasawa should have also been sleeping at the guest house, while Genji should have been sleeping at the mansion. However, it seems that Krause had suddenly ordered that the schedule be modified. The shit of the guest house and the mansion had all been reversed, and Genji was spending the night at the guest house. It's probably because of Beatrice's letter. Why, probably? After such a mysterious letter appeared, it's only natural that Krauss would suspect one of us. We serve directly under the master, so Krauss tried as best as he could to keep us far away from the family conference. Genji, Shannon, and Kana were all permitted to wear the Ushirami of Family Crest, the one-winged eagle, as a servant who served directly under Kenzo. Of course, since they were working for the Ushirami of Family, they had to obey anyone's orders, but their only boss was Kenzo. Since only Kenzo held the right to employ them, even Krauss could not have had them dismissed of his own accord. 
Because of this, Kraus and the others often viewed these servants as Kenzo's underlings and shunned them. And in fact, Kenzo seldom let anyone other than them enter his study. This sudden shift change was probably the clear expression of the sense of mistrust that had caused. Considering the time Kenzo had left to live, this would definitely be the last family conference before the problem of the inheritance came up. On top of that, the mysterious letter had claimed to be from Beatrice had dropped in out of the blue. Krauss definitely wanted to keep Kenzo's loyal subjects away from the table of such a delicate and important discussion. If you would excuse me, I will go rest. If anything happens, call me immediately. Our guest tonight is a special case after all. So they all know about Beatrice, like they know 100% that Beatrice is a witch and that she's real. They just not saying shit. <laughs> Yes, yeah, certainly, Genji-sama. Genji nodded back, went behind the screen, took off his jacket, and slowly began to pull his cup, and slowly began to relax after a day's worth of tension. The ones who just returned now, were they the children? Yes, the other relatives are having a conference in the mansion. It looked like it would drag on for quite some time. Am I fat? Am I fat, guys? I don't... I'm not fat. Then we've got it easy. It's already this late and there's this weather. The rest of the relatives will probably spend the night in their rooms in the mansion. Yes, probably. I'm only saying it's because Genji isn't around. But I'm a little happy I was sent to the guest house, I guess. Oh. Why is that? Because you can stay away from Madame and Eva-sama, those bullies? Or do you have another reason? It's not as though I have... A another reason. I see. Then let's do our best together with our night shift. I'm counting on you. She wants to slobber on George Dick. Just now, I was asked to go to the children's room and play with them. Shannon hung her head un apologetically, gazing at Kanan uncertainly. Kanan didn't try to meet her eyes. He spoke curtly as he sighed. It looked like he didn't plan on indulging his sister. You can't. You were assigned to the night shift. Besides which, it isn't necessary for furniture like us to respond to an invitation to play. You understand, right? Yes, I do understand. Shannon's shoulders drooped slightly. She had already expected that Kanan, a stickler for the rules, would say something like that, but she still seemed a little discouraged. As Kanan flipped through the logbook, he spoke without facing Shana. That means the children will be waiting for you. You'll have to apologize and tell them that the night shift, tell them you have the night shift and won't be able to stay with them. Go and come back. Huh? Ah, yes. I'll go apologize and come back. Shannon hurriedly stood from her seat before her brother's mood could change and flew out of the servant room before giving a quick bow. Oh, that's an excuse! As he watched her go, Kanan took a single deep breath. Genji's voice came from beyond the screen. Gen Kanon. I will be here so you can go too. Genji. Shannon was the only one called. It's not as though I was invited. That is only because you were not there at the time. If you had been, you would have been invited as well. It is good for it is good to play as a child from time to time. No such thing is necessary for me. Stop being a bitch and go, nigga. Damn. Be a kid. Experience childhood. Human children may need may have a need to play, but we are furniture. Is that so? Nesan is also furniture. Even if she pretends to be a person, it will only hurt her later. I understand that, so I try not to get too close to people, that's all. Genji did not say anything after that. After a while, he stood up and used a pot of hot water to make powdered cocoa. Serving some to Kanon as well. Is that for real? I had no clue. 
Dumbass, you're too loud. You'll make Mar you'll wake Mario up. Battler was so surprised that he yelled obnoxiously and scattered his cards everywhere. His voice caused Mario to turn over once, but she soon fell back into a deep sleep. Jessica punched the shit out of him, and he lowered his voice. Still, seriously, now that you mention it, they really did have that kind of atmosphere, didn't they? Now I see. So George is... George couldn't be seen anywhere in the room. A short while ago, when Shannon came into the room, George suddenly said he'd forgotten something in the mansion and needed to go back to get it. Shannon said she would guide him, just like she had on the way to the guest house, and the two of them departed together. They fucking... Yeah. Well, there's actually been signs of it for a while now. You know, questions about hobbies and favorite things? I always thought it was a bit much for a passing interest, and look what's happened now. Come to think of it, I get the feeling George always has been overly nice to Shana. Now I get it. They fucking... Let me get this screenshot. I'll get that. Oh. This shot is hard as fuck, too. Let me get that. Fuck you, George! According to the weather report, it looks like it'll be at its worst tonight. It also seems it'll last all day tomorrow, though it should get a little better. Really? Then maybe the boat won't arrive until the day after tomorrow. I hope that doesn't interfere with your work on Monday. <laughs> I already knew the typhoon would be coming beforehand. Just in case, I made sure I didn't have any plans on for Monday, so it's okay. I may not look it, but I really am the type who can plan ahead in this schedule. George puffed out his chest, acting proud. Compared to the calm appearance George always had as the oldest cousin, he now looked amusingly like a little kid. Shannon chuckled at this abrupt contrast. It's no surprise you're so well prepared, as someone who'll bring prosperity to his company someday. Well, making a good company- making a company prosper really is a tough job. DISGUSTING PERVERT! Money isn't the only thing that's important. I learned that well when studying under my father. Making a company prosper is like owning a castle and leading your subordinates. My dad really loves reading about great leaders during the warring periods of Japan. A hobby that's probably influenced by the fact he shares Toyotomi Hideyoshi's name. Much of his philosophy on managing businesses comes from talking about them. Did you know? It's a lot of fucking words, shit. Takeda Shingen, who was feared as the leader of the strongest cavalry corps in the warring periods, started out with his troops in complete disarray and didn't have the kind of strong leadership necessary to utilize them well. Is that true? That's a little unexpected. In order to unite his troops, Shingen showed his excellent leadership in many ways. For example, when a soldier succeeded well in battle, he would immediately honor them with a medal. Normally, that kind of thing was put off until after the war, and they were all rewarded at once. He continued this diligently while on the field of battle, and immediately showed his appreciation for his troops' military exploits, motivated them in an extremely significant fashion. Also, whenever one of his troops was brought down by an illness, he would be the first to rush up to them and care for them and so on. Takeda Shingen wasn't just a man who led the strongest cavalry corps in the warring period. He was, all, he was the person who cared the most for his troops throughout the warring period. And because he was that kind of a person, of course he was that kind of person, all of his troops went along with him. The truth was, Shana had already heard this story several years ago, but whenever a discussion of his father led to this sort of topic, George would always glow and look like he was having a great time. So Shana just smiled without interrupting, urging him to continue. That sounds like me whenever literally anybody in my family <laughs> is on the phone with me, you know? I just start yapping about dumb shit I've already talked about, and they're just like, he seems to be enjoying himself, so I, I, I guess I'll let him talk.
Of course, in a capitalist world, money determines both your strength and the height of your fortifications. But you can build up a castle and succeed in war by yourself. Such things can only be accomplished with the support of many subordinates by borrowing their strength. After understanding this, when I look at my father's back, I realize how immature I am. I can clearly see how much competition he had to overcome before building up all he has now. George, you truly look up to your father. I'm jealous. S sorry, that's not how I meant it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not how I meant it either. The two of them awkwardly look at their feet, when really they should be looking into each other's eyes and kissing. Shannon had no parents. <laughs> Fuck. I got water on my camera. I hope that doesn't look weird. You can tell I'm tired because I'm just doing shit now. Shannon had no parents. She had been brought up in an orphanage owned by Kenzo, called the Fukuin House. Under the guidance of Kenzo, their honorary director, the orphanage offered members who excelled a high chance for the on-the-job serving experience. If their efforts met with Kenzo's approval, They'd be able to leave the orphanage and work as servants for the Ushiramiya family. This was considered to be the highest honor for those who lived in the orphanage. Servants from the Fukuin house all took names with the character on in them when they, while they served. Shannon, Kanon. So Shannon wasn't a real name. The same went for Kanon. All of the members of the Fukuin house were orphans. At least, they were all people who had been separated from their parents under special circumstances. Because of this, the orphans had been taught to think of each other as their only family. That's why it seemed so natural for both of them when Kanon called Shannon his sister. And while Shannon and Kanon were working in the mansion today, there were several other servants possessing the blank, the on character in their name, such as Manon and Lenon, who often worked in a rotation schedule. However, there were not many servants who stayed in the Oshiramiya family for long. It was standard for them to quit after three years. So you could probably say this, that Shannon, who had been working for 10 years, was a notable exception to the rule. Working as a servant for the Oshiramiya family was a heavy burden to bear, but the pay wasn't bad at all. Working for a full three years would earn more than what was needed to enter mainstream society. That was why, even though the orphans realized what a harsh task working for the Oshiramiya family was, they still hoped to be accepted. Maybe the fact that Shion managed to continue working for 10 years was it because she had more willpower than the other servants. Maybe she'd gotten stuck working for 10 years because she didn't have the courage to say she wanted to quit. Kenzo couldn't even trust his own blood relatives, and those excellent servants sit from the Fukuin house were the only ones he could rely on. Because of that, Kenzo would sometimes allow them to wear the family crest as servants under his direct control and have them work close to him. You've been working here for almost 10 years now, right? You must have saved up a lot of money by now. I wonder. It's not like there's anything particular I'd like to buy. After all, a few million yen is enough, isn't enough to live off for the rest of your life. So the reason you've been working all this time wasn't to hit some target, son? Yes, that's right. I have nowhere to go outside this mansion, and I have been getting along well with the milady, with milady and the other young servants. Madam does scold me sometimes, but caring for the roses and cleaning the mansion is fun. But that can't be your entire life, Shana. No, Sayo. Shannon cast her eyes downward when she heard her real name. She understood what George was trying to say and fell silent. There's something I've learned as I come to study under e study even after becoming an adult and a full-fledged member of society. A human's life is not so is not as monotonous or short as we thought when we were kids. All school-age students have certain fears they can't shake. They wonder whether they'll live the rest of their lives like sleepy classes after monotonous and boring school days. 
spending their time in carefree laziness without anything interesting happening until it's all over. However, life's only like that for underage students. Compared to a human's life, the time they spend as students is nothing more than a blink of an eye, a period where they can break through the shells of their immaturity. The inside of the shell might be a hot, suffocating, and boring world, but the world beyond that shell is vast and filled with limitless possibilities. So far, your life has been trapped inside the shell called Shannon. I think you're under the mistaken impression that your life will continue like this forever. That's... Shannon couldn't deny those words. She'd been unable to harbor any clear doubts about her lifestyle. And since she never had any hopes or goal for changing herself, she lazily, lazily fucking something. Damn, Zeke. For one second, stop skipping. She lazily continued living the way she always had. And if asked whether this life was satisfying, she wouldn't have been able to nod. She may have been intentionally averting her eyes from the truth. Without George's admonish ad admonishments, she would have continued pretending not to notice as her real life slipped away bit by bit, neglected. George, is it wrong for me to continue living this way? Yeah, it is. Oh, and by the way, didn't you just break one of our rules just now? George immediately gave a strict answer, then broke out into a mischievous smile. Shannon already knew what she was being chided for, and she hung her head again, apparently embarrassed. Didn't you promise not to use Sama when the two of us are alone? I couldn't obey that as a promise, but if it was in order, I would have to obey it, because I'm furniture. Then it is in order. He's got that master servant riz. He's got... Um... Yes. Certainly. George? When Shannon hung her head, her face red. She said George's name again. This time following it with San. Yes. That's fine, Saya. George smiled at Shana. No, Saya. To praise her small act of bravery. This short exchange alone made it clear how far back the relationship must have stretched. For a long while, the two talked as if the weather raging about them didn't even enter their thoughts. They talked about the many memories they built during their relationship that no one else knew about. Every once in a while, a flash of lightning would attempt to interrupt them, but this could sully neither the roses nor the time they spent blushing at each other. Just fuck already, damn! What's this? What's going on? Oh, shit. That's right. I have something I wanted to show you. It's approximately seven inches. What could it be? George, who had been speaking eloquently, suddenly started to stutter. Watching him, Shana seemed to guess something. George timidly searched through his pocket. Something got caught in the depths of his pocket and just looked like... And just like the stuttering George, it took a while to get it out. That's a bar. It was a very small box. A small box covered in deep blue velvet room. That peculiar shape was enough to tell anyone what was resting inside. Just like that? My nigga, just like that? Shannon had prepared her heart somewhat. Certain beforehand that this is what he'd been planning. But even so, when she actually saw it, she couldn't avoid blushing once more. George opened the small box, took something out, and held it out for Shannon to take. I want you to take this. I... I couldn't accept something so valuable. You can't take it? No. Um... I'm unworthy of such a thing. Saya, this isn't a request. It's an order. Take this ring, okay? 
If it's in order, I cannot disobey. Yeah, that's right. Well done. Oh! Oh, that is a shot! I fucking like that! I like that! I like that! Shauna, not wanting to show her bright red face, timidly accepted the ring from George's hand while still staring at the ground. That ring wasn't a simple accessory. It was a noble object, meant since ancient times to be offered to a special woman under special circumstances. Therefore, while George could order her to take it, he could not order anything beyond that. Anything beyond that would depend not on an order, but on Shanon, no, Sayo's own will. So, from here on, I'm not ordering you anymore. Sayo, I want you to give me your answer by tomorrow without using words. Do you understand? How should I... I won't order you any further, so this isn't an order. But a ring is something you put on your finger after all. If you like it, you can just put it on any finger you choose. You gotta put it on that ring finger. I don't, I don't remember which one resembles engagement or marriage. So you gotta put it on that ring finger and then maybe do a little bit of it. Hold, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Shannon have only pretended not to know. She already understood what he wanted her to do. But she was standing at a huge crossroads of her life. Look how late it's gotten. Let's call it a day. George turned away from Shannon, acting just a bit bluntly. I could probably order you to wear it on your left hand. You might be timid and independent enough to actually obey that kind of order. But I want at least this last step to be done by your own will, Sayo. Understand? Yes. So, that's my order. I want you to think about it well tonight and show me your answer tomorrow. Shana nodded back. The day was a culmination of their many days spent together. This moment certainly hadn't come as a surprise to Shana. We should be getting back to the guest house soon. If we take any longer, we'll make everyone worry about us. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I... I just remembered I had something to do back at the mansion, so... Uh, I have to go back to the mansion. At a time like this? Is that true? Joyce said in Shannon's face as he laughed mischievously. He definitely saw through Shannon's lie. However, when he saw how she felt, he could sort of understand that she might be so embarrassed that she'd want to be alone. But because George realized the meaning behind Shannon's lie, he accepted it. Are they gonna, is she gonna decline? Cause remember the first part of Beatrice's um, little epitaph or Kento's epitaph, that's what it was, right? was that lovers would be uh, like a, a pair of lovers would break apart and when they when they said that i immediately thought about george and shannon so like is something gonna happen here that's fucked that could mean that one they're gonna break up that could mean one of them is gonna die oh shit. Fuck. It's been a while since I scared the fuck out of me like that. Oh shit, one more hour until silly hour. That's why each that's why each chapter has been roughly an hour long, huh? Because it's at, we're actually going like hour by hour in the game story. Because in one more hour, I guess I guess that's when shit goes down. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and read them off, tap into the next one. Um, my next few videos will probably be over here without the green screen. This goes for other series as well. I'm current. Uh, uh, um, by the time y'all see this, you know, y'all will probably already have. You might have um, seen the post I put on YouTube. But I'm currently doing this a thing where I'm done. Like, with a, with a lot of these games, story-based, heavily story-based, I'm done, like, you know 
um, recording an episode and then uploading it and then waiting until I have time for the next one. I'm done doing that. I'm just gonna finish the whole shit or finish a whole section and then upload all of that and then upload the next section when I finish that. I'm gonna just start doing it like that from now on, all right? Because that way it's just, it's just a lot easier for me to manage, schedule, and it's, I feel like it's gonna be a bit easier on y'all too, since y'all get it consistently and like, you know, you don't gotta deal with episode one of Umi Neko on today and then episode two, five years from now, like I have been doing. So, hope y'all enjoy it. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, read them off, tap into the next one, man. I really, oh, I'm fucking loving this game. Seriously, I'm really fucking loving this game. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know how she's gonna go down. I don't know when she's going down. But shit is currently on the way of going down. And I'm here for it. I am fucking here for it. Peace out. I love y'all.